All right, you're up. Okay. Thank you, Gary, for organizing this. Um, it's a great opportunity. Um, I'm really excited today to talk about our most recent eelgrass project that really we've begun um, in earnest in 2021. So it's all new stuff. Um, I'm working together with Forrest Shank on it. And we're, we had the opportunity also to collaborate with the um, GIS team at DFG, Kevin Robichaud and Dan Coach, which has been um, really a great partnership. And it, this is funded by, um, through the Mass in Luffy program. So get started. Eelgrass. Most of you, I hope, know that eelgrass is an important habitat for marine fishery species. And it's not only important for forage and refuge, but it also, the plants also bind the sediment, um, protecting shoreline from erosion. They oxygenate the sediment and they clean the water column. Um, so they're, they're really a, a critical um, coastal resource. They're, they also um, are a carbon sink. So if you've heard of blue carbon, um, there's um, a lot of thought about how we need to continue to restore and preserve our eelgrass because it's retaining um, atmospheric carbon as well. And in this picture, these pictures, you can see um, some of the cool shots that we've taken in our eelgrass meadows. The um, picture right here is a school of pollock that we saw in our um, seagrass net site in Salem Sound. This is a neat angle on a winter flounder in um, Manchester by the sea outer harbor. This is one of our quad rats uh, monitoring sites. And um, over here, right here, this is eelgrass seeds. They kind of look like little tic tacs and seeding is also an important um, restoration method as well as planting um, live adult shoots. So unfortunately, status of eelgrass in Massachusetts is tracking the status of seagrass worldwide, which is that it's declining. Um, and recent look at the eelgrass change from 1994 to 2017 shows a 46% loss of eelgrass. Um, during that time period. So it went from 15,100 hectares to 8,100 hectares in that time period. Um, and the losses are really dominated by loss on the, the Cayman Islands. Um, we have a 62% loss um, at, on the islands and 52 and 56% um, loss in the Cape compared to in the North Shore, there was a 12% loss of eelgrass. And it's thought that Eelgrass loss is really um, caused by uh, continued decline in water quality in the coastal areas, as well as direct loss from um, dredging and coastal construction projects, boating activity, um, both causing a direct loss and a loss of um, decline of water quality too. So to take a little bit of a closer look at where we're seeing these coastal, um, the coastal alteration projects and the impacts to eelgrass, in our 2020 annual report for the Habitat Program, Kate Fru um, put together these figures looking at all of the coastal alteration projects that we review in our environmental review project. So our, our reviewers in Gloucester and the and New Bedford office together reviewed 566 projects that impacted fisheries habitat just in 2020. And of those projects, 43 of them impacted eelgrass. You can see here that it's uh, again, dominated by impacts on the Cape. And these are because I think there's just a lot of um, small dock and piers probably driving this, but there's also impacts up in the North Shore and we, different years, we see more impacts in the Boston area, and Plymouth things in Ducks Free Bay and Gloucester too. So it changes year to year how this distribution um, comes out. So eelgrass is, um, it's a valuable resource. Like I said before, it's also really costly to restore. So as far as the valuation of eelgrass, there's been different studies and, um, you know, just pulling out one, it's an older one from 2016, and, and they thought, well, maybe it, 
based on what we're looking at, we think it's $76,000 per acre. It would be the value of eelgrass, but they didn't include the importance to fisheries. So that's a big piece. So I think it's a lot more than that. I know from my personal experience that it costs us $350,000 to plant an acre of eelgrass. And that is everything. That's site selection, that's um, the transplanting, that's the monitoring for five years, the whole thing. So the Mass in Lieu Fee program is, um, so just very quickly, when projects uh, impact uh, resource areas, they are required by the Army Corps of Engineers and DEP if, they've, if they're over a certain threshold, they're required to mitigate for those losses. And one way they can mitigate through the federal process is to pay a fee in lieu of doing an on the ground mitigation project. So if you impacted a square foot of veal grass, you would pay $14.26. So that comes out to $621,330 per square acre for an in lieu fee cost. And with these, generally, there are smaller um, fees that are being paid, and it's kind of a, it's accrued in this bucket of mitigation um, funds to nine hundred and fourteen thousand dollars for subtitle mitigation that's available. So the core has this money, and they need to spend it on mitigating subtitle habitats, and eelgrass is one of those habitats and they they need to also show that they're doing this and so through the the in lieu fee program there'll be a request for proposals and proposals will come back and they'll be funded from this pot of money but the question comes like okay, how if we need to re do restoration of eelgrass and mitigation of these this loss of eelgrass where do we go so took a quick look at um all the sites that have been planted with eelgrass in Massachusetts since the 90s. And there have been 49 sites that have been planted. Um, and these, there's not 49 dots on here, but there's most of the sites are accounted for in the areas that are accounted for. So um, DMF did a big project in Boston Harbor. Other groups have done restorations in Boston Harbor. DMF's done work up in Salem Sound um, and the um, Anasquam and in, um, the north area, but other groups have as well. And so this, this kind of shows the distribution of planted sites. Of those 49 cent sites, 10 sites have been successful and they're still vegetated today. So you've got some successful sites in Boston, successful sites in Salem Sound um, and in New Bedford um, back in 2000. Um, and I was involved in that in my graduate work at UNH. So one of the reasons why you might say, oh, well, only 10 sites of the 49 that were planted are successful, that's not that great. It keeps coming back to site selection. And site, the site selection process is really a best practice for um, seagrass restoration right now. And um, it, we did a site selection model back in 2004 before planting in Boston Harbor. Um, and then in our Salem Sound, we updated a site selection model too to look at different factors. So site selection models are out there and um, they are best management to practice, um, but they're typically done for um, the low hanging fruit of, of data that's available and then only for a specific embayment. So some site selection models might focus on um, just the sediment type and the water quality and throw in some test plots. Others really focus on the historic eelgrass presence. And so one model I was just looking at really just, just did light availability and boating use to drive where they planted. So that that's great. We wanted to take a larger look at the whole coast of Massachusetts um, to address some um, needs of the Army Corps of Engineers. So our goal is to create, and we're working on it right now, is to create an adaptive, updatable model with as many factors as we can find, and then also measure at spots along the coast. And the idea is, um, the goals are really one, to narrow down on potential restoration sites, 
obviously, two, to help understand where the data gaps are that can um, help inform us how to improve our restoration in site selection. And three is to assist the Corps in their decisions on how to mitigate eelgrass loss from coastal alteration projects. Again, we were funded through the ILF program to um, take a large view of the whole coastline in all of their service areas and really create a layer that can be used by other practitioners and by future efforts um, where they can like say, okay, well, we're going to zoom in and this is what, this is this baseline that DMF found. So there's a view of the whole coast. I'm going to zoom in on the Plymouth Kings and Duxbury Bay, just so you can see in more detail of how we're doing this. To start with, um, we took the bathymetry, uh, the best bathymetry that we could find in the coastal area, and we thought, okay, well, where we know that eelgrass grows, it's usually not growing in the really shallow and it's not growing in the really deep. We looked at where eelgrass was growing right now, and it falls within greater than a meter and a half and less than five meters. So we clipped all the bathymetry at that zone. So that's the, whoops, that's the depth th zone. Then we looked at surficial sediment layer, the 2020 um, surficial sediment that was a uh, Barnhart scale put together by CZM that we got from Dan Sampson at CZM. And we, it's, it's ranked as like the Barnhart scale is kind of like sandy mud, muddy sand, that kind of thing. So we, and it's also ranked by the, um, the, um, what's it called, um, the quality of the data that, um, the confidence level, there it is, the confidence level of the data that was collected. So we, we first said, okay, all the high confidence mud and high confidence rock, we're gonna exclude that because you know, we just, we're not gonna plant in those areas. Um, it's not good for eelgrass. So we cut those out of the depth. And then we looked at where is the existing eelgrass. And so we have the 2017, 2019 and 2020 DEP mapping data. And we're not gonna plant where there's existing eelgrass. So we cut that out. And then we cut out, we did the mooring fields and aquaculture and we cut those out. So then we have this preliminary suitability layer and we have it for the whole coastline. But there are lots of other factors to consider. And this is where it's gonna get really exciting. So the sediment layer that I just talked about has a lot of information in there. Um, and so we, we went further and we did kind of a stoplight approach where everything that's sand and maybe sandy silt um, with high confidence, we're gonna make that green because that's, that's where eelgrass really likes to grow. And then the stuff that's still like rocky, gravelly, and or like super muddy, we're going to put that in orange. And that's because that's not as as an ideal of a spot. And then the stuff in the middle is yellow. So this can help further winter down, winnow down, you know, okay, I think like of this, you know, these areas in green might be a good suitable place. Then we looked at historic eelgrass that's no longer present. So in Plymouth, Kings and Duxbury Bay, we've seen a lot of losses. This map shows the grass that used to be there that's not there anymore. So I'm thinking like somewhere in here might be a good place to put a, put a plot. Okay, now we're working on fetch. And this is really like hot off the cutting board. We were working on this yesterday. We're not, we're not there yet with the fetch model. There's different ways that you can calculate fetch. Um, you can look at it just at the Northeast facing parts of the coast and take that away. Fetch really is the, the distance between um, your site and the next land. So how much distance does, you know, where, where's the threshold for where eelgrass can grow? Some of the literature say six miles, but that was in a different region. So we're not quite sure. This is our preliminary fetch model. And so we, we're, we're going to keep working on this and then we're going to um, overlay those areas and that'll further inform um, our site selection. We also may, might wanna calculate wave exposure, which could be something that has, that's fetch mixed with the, um, 
the wave modeling um, residence time. I just found out that CZM has residence time data for embayments in uh, Mass Bay's region. So I'll look at that. Then another thing, Matt, the Mass Bay's program has divided our coastline into separate ecotypes. So like the North Shore dominated by rocky coastline, that's in its own ecotype. Then the Boston Harbor area that has more anthropogenic sediments, that's in a separate ecotype. And the Cape, which is dominated by sand, that's in another ecotype. So it's really um, like ecologically focused. But I was thinking maybe we want to work that into how we do our model and like have different um, different drivers in, in each of those different ecotypes potentially. And I'm also working on pulling together, I showed you just in previous slide, all the past restoration efforts. We wanna get more information about those restorations that some were done in the 90s and then all the way up till now. Um, how successful were they? You know, Why did they fail? And add that into our model. And finally, I'm thinking, that there might be a role for experts site specific knowledge. And what I mean by this is, is there a way we can like have a meeting with um, seagrass biologists and that are that practice in Massachusetts and really know the coastline and say, you know, based on what we have so far, would you plant here? And I can say that I'm, I've looked at our model so far and there are some areas that are green that I would not plant. Um, so how can we capture that on the ground um, site specific or institutional knowledge in some way. These are things that we have to think about. So this summer, we're looking at our preliminary um, transplant suitability model, and we're going to target sites that we think look pretty good. We're going to collect more data. So we got these really cool instruments um, to collect light data. They're PAR sensors, so they, they look at the photosynthetically active radiation, which is a light is very important for eelgrass growth. Um, and so from this, we can get the percent of light that hits the canopy. And we can also get the KD or the attenuation of light through the water column. And these are really important factors and there are thresholds in the literature. Um, and the cool thing about this is we ha we haven't had an instrument like this before. We can leave this in all summer long, so we can get a assessment of a site for the whole summer. We before this we've had just a par sensor that you drop over the boat for um, spot checks when you're in the field that day. So this is going to be um, really good data. I'm really excited about it. Um, we're also going to when we go to the sites, we're going to look: are there conflicting uses? Does everyone go there on Saturday? Although I don't know if we're going to be there on Saturdays, but we'll find out. Does anyone, do people go there and anchor and, you know, have their their parties there? Because that's not where we want to plant eelgrass. Um, also, there's other projects have gotten into problems with in, conf, conflicts with fisheries. So we don't want to overlap an area that is like a razor clam targeted fishery uh, site. And then finally, we'll look and see are there a lot of bioturbators at the site or crabs burrowing? Are there, is there a lot of algae, a lot of kelp there that might um, inhibit planting? So with all this information, we're building this back into our model. This is a diagram showing our the model that we have so far, our exclusion model and all the steps that we took. But the next thing is we really wanna think about how where do we wanna go from here, do we want to do more of a species distribution model where we say, okay, where every place that we see eelgrass now, these are the factors um, of the site and where else do we see these factors and are those going to be good places for to potentially plant? Or do we want to do more of a multiplicative scored model where we say, okay, if it's rock, it's a zero, but if it's sand, it's a two, and um, all the other things in between that you add up and you have weighted um, factors that you pick the highest score. So then you can look at a map and it, and the scores, if, if something is ranked really highly, that would be a good site potentially to plant. So we're still thinking through this.
So the vision is that the, an interactive site suitability model for the whole state will be a tool that practitioners can use and you know, we can use and other user groups can use and the core can use and they can zoom in. So this would be the layer and then you could zoom in and see this stoplight approach. Um, so you can say, okay, well, it looks like this is green. So based on this, we're, we're gonna target the green areas and go in the field and get more information. So this is supposed to be a first look um, to narrow it down for people. And also again, so the core can see, you know, how much potential restoration do we have out there in Massachusetts? Um, or are there factors that are preventing sites from being suitable for restoration that we potentially need to address first? So not this summer, but next summer, we will be test planting the sites that looked good in our model and looked good in for the first field checks and the, the collected data on light, we're going to be planting test plots. And for anyone who hasn't seen any of our talks about planting, just quickly, we harvest the plants, either diving or if we're lucky, we can snorkel. Um, and then we weave them into these burlap discs and um, string them on a on a um, on a wire and take them down with us when we dive and then we plant each of these uh, burlap discs has 10 shoots woven into it and so we plant 50 shoots per meter squared in a pattern like this and um, flip it so it's like a checkerboard pattern and that method has worked really well for us so after we plant we monitor the site and we look at the total planting units that survive, the shoot density, um, and we take notes and photographs, and then we measure the plot dimensions, and we also acoustically map the site, um, particularly at the end of a restoration. We always are now acoustically mapping it, um, and that's a good way um, for us to gauge, an another way to gauge the area that's restored. So after we do our test plots, that'll come back into the uh, model. And again, there's like two phases of the model. So the, the first one is the exclusion, but the second is when, when we can layer all these other pieces of information on top. So from there, then you would be able to say, okay, this site was test plotted and it has 60% survival and a lot more information about it. Um, so that's our vision. And I'd love to hear what you guys think. And we're really excited about the project. So thank you very much. And thanks for listening to my talk and I'll take any questions. Thanks, Tay. Good talk. Do you have questions for Tay?